Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, most, most welcome here to this exciting seminar. Digital transformation is the future for human skills. We don't know the answer yet. Let's hope the answer is yes somehow. Uh, and in particular, most welcome to you all, but in particular uh, to Teresa Junek, who is Senior Advisor of Public Affairs at Almeca, and Dan Daniel Akinin, uh, who is Chief Technology Officer for Microsoft. Uh, I will not say much more at this stage. We all know that these are issues that concerns us all. Uh, regardless of what we think about it, it will transform the society in one way or another. And to, want, to a certain extent, to huge or just large, and, and so forth. Uh, I will not say more about you either uh, at this stage. Uh, in order to save some time, uh, you will introduce yourself more fully later on, and, and, and where you come from, etc. Uh, regarding questions, we will take questions afterwards, primarily. There will be some at the end, so you think about good questions in, in, in the process. Uh, yet, we will, we will take short, brief questions, clarifying questions in, in as we go on as well. So by that, I give the word to you first, Theresa, yeah. we'll start, and, and then you will come later on. My name is Teresa Jonik and I work as a public um, uh, advisor at Almega and I, my speciality is research and innovation. First a few words just shortly about uh, Almega. Almega is the largest organization within the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise, so Svensk Nagelsliv. And we represent the service sector, the, the service sector, the service intensive sector, as well as the uh, knowledge intensive service sector. And today I will focus on the latter one. So by that I mean the companies within the IT and T sector, uh, consultant engineering, architects, uh, private care providers, media, education, uh, yeah, primarily. We have about 11,000 member companies, and as you know, we're, uh, we help our companies with uh, negotiations with the union. I don't work with that, but that's one part of our business. And the other one is that we try to um, inform and influence our politicians about the needs for the service sector. Because as you know, we come from an industrial background, so there's some information that needs to be said. Um, I will give you a short uh, presentation about the development we see driven by globalization and digitalization regarding the competitiveness of the knowledge intensive service sector, uh, the production uh, as part of our export. So this is what we see due to much due to digitalization. Uh, yes, uh, a few words about uh, knowledge intensive service businesses, you, uh, we usually call them KIBS, or yeah, it's an international word, KIBS. Um, as I said, there are businesses uh, um, in engineering, IT, design, and staffing also, uh, I didn't mention that. And they have gained uh, an increasing importance in the Swedish economy, and this is due to the structural changes that's been going on for decades, but also um, well, within that, the globalization, which has driven the companies to specialize, to be able to be competitive, and uh, um, are eager to take place in the higher value um, of the global change. Um, the demand for business services is, as you might uh, expect, from the manufacturing industry that has um, outsourced a lot of businesses to the service companies. Um, and but in fact, the demand is even greater from the service companies itself, I mean the sector itself. Uh, it's, uh, we actually have, I, I don't know if it's the largest or the second largest uh, KIBS sector within the OECD countries. So in that way we do stick out in Sweden. Uh, we have about 1.2 million employees in this sector, so it, uh, it's quite a lot. And among these, um, uh, half a million jobs have been created the last two decades. So it's like a job machine, you can say. And uh, they pack their services directly as uh, service um, sold on the market, but also as input into other businesses' uh, products, like, for example, manufacturing business. 
So, and they need to work uh, very much with their business model, especially now in the digitalization era. Um, they have to balance, they have to keep up their productivity, but they want to, of course, be customer um, adjusted. I mean, they look at the customer's needs, but they also have to work with like standardized modules to be able to keep up their productivity. And this is also something that kind of puts them um, in a, what can I say, a, a dangerous uh, place because those standardized packages can al also be copied by uh, like global competitors. Um, yeah. So I will just uh, go into the export because um, well, we, as you know, we are very strongly dependent on our export in Sweden. We are a, a, a small open economy and about 1.1 million people are employed uh, producing our export. So if you consider the value added today, if as much as 54% of uh, the export is actually services. And this is, as I said before, direct services sold by the companies on the export market, but also services put into the export industry products sold on the market. So, ex for example, if Volvo produces a car, Samcom might have been doing the product development in the car. So. And uh, this is not so surprising, maybe, because we know that the, the, um, the ink the increased standard of living and the buying power globally has gone up and this also goes hand in hand with the demand for services. So you can say that this is actually an illustration about Sweden's position within the global chains. And um, well, digitalization of our society influences all sectors and especially the service sector is um, affected in a subversive and, uh, well, revolutionary way. And this is because the services can be transferred, especially the knowledge intensive ones, transferred digitally. So when you buy a service, uh, comp um, in, uh, it's usually put together with pieces from different countries in the world. Um, so, but this is fine. I mean, this is trade, this is competition, open markets, and pushing us forward. So. No problem with that, but what we see now that kind of worries us is that we see that um, the import share, this is from statistics from um, SCB, uh, the National Board of Statistics, I think they're called. The share of imported services uh, used in the production of our export is actually increasing. So that means that the 54% that I was talking about uh, is actually uh, consists of a lot of uh, services produced in low-cost countries like India, China, Macedonia, Hungary, uh, yeah. And um, um, that raises two questions for us. Why is this import share increasing and uh, what, what does it consist of? Uh, well, we can say that, the, first of all, there are an increased number of um, international, uh, global uh, suppliers on the market in Sweden today. Like, for example, you can say Tata or HCL. They have a very small organization in Sweden and they pr produce um, the services in low cost countries, maybe their home countries or spread over low cost countries. So, uh, this means that the price, uh, there's a price pressure uh, on the Swedish market. So the Swedish uh, suppliers, they have a hard time raising the prices, uh, even though the demand for the service is actually very high. So, um, and also together with that, the, the, on the Swedish market, there's a great lack of competence. They cannot, the, the companies cannot find uh, skilled people. And this is really the most severe um, point, maybe. And of course, there are engineers and so forth on the market. And they, since they know that they're a very attractive workforce, they want their salaries, their wages to raise. So you get a wage drift, but because you cannot raise the wages since the price pressure is pushing the prices down by the foreign suppliers. And also, as you know, we have high taxes on labor. So these facts, they do, 
um, I shouldn't say force the, the companies to outsource more and more of their production that is then actually exported from Sweden. And this is all uh, because, um, because of the complex digital product change or stars that are formed. Uh, so dig the digital technique is actually um, um, can I say, pushing this uh, development ahead. So uh, then I will go on to what is outsourced, because uh, this is maybe what worries us the most. Because we have seen that more simple production, like production plans or different calculations, they have been outsourced for, for a long time to low-cost countries. Uh, but what we see now is that the services that are outsourced are much more advanced and much more complex to the nature. And this is uh, a problem. Um, you know, you can uh, take the... Um, look at what happened to the manufacturing industry that is now m much less people employed. And um, uh, the thing is, we've said that we want to be a knowledge economy. We want to co our, uh, we want to compete with knowledge and the complex and systems and uh, then um, uh, and we want to focus on these segments with great added value and the global change. So. The thing is, we wonder what happens if we outsource more and more of this, what, what will that lead to in the end? And, uh, of course, um, lack of uh, advanced labor, that is not a quick fix. Uh, it takes some time to deliver uh, skilled people. So that's why, uh, not just Almega, but several organizations say we need to act now. We need to... Uh, educate more people and have a greater matching between the needs, uh, I mean the demands from the, from the um, enterprises as well as uh, from the universities. And uh, uh, also uh, we must stop expelling foreign people, uh, competent foreign employees like we do right now. And you know there's a, there's a discussion, and you've probably seen it in the media, but still uh, it's going to take at least six months before they get um, the laws together, so um, we, we can stop this bureaucratic nonsense, really. And also, um, we have the automation of services, like, uh, you know, artificial intelligence that Daniel will talk more about. Um, it is um, taking over some services, like um, I mean, construction plans, calculations, data uh, of different kinds. And uh, today, many of, of our companies, are, they outsource this to low-cost countries. But then on the other hand, if, we, if you kind of take it back and you automize it, then you will also release more power, more working power in those countries that can take over uh, more complex and advanced services. So you can, this whole process might accelerate. Um, so what we say that we must create systems that are competitive and one thing that we need to, to make our politicians understand is that the, the, comp the competition of competence is global. So um, we try to say this so many times but it's like uh, our politicians usually, all, uh, they seem to think that an engineer, for example, in Sweden is much better than an engineer in China or an engineer in India, but that's not true. So, and uh, with digitalization, you can move uh, the services. So, so our tax system, education system, and regulations on the labor market must be competitive. And this is, of course, to uh, make the companies want to invest here, but also to attract skilled people. So that's about what I was going to say. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my plan is to uh, spend the next 30-35 uh, minutes or so to uh, discuss some of the technology trends that we are seeing. So you're talking about automation, you're talking about a lot of 
stuff that's getting to become digitalized. And I'm going to talk about what can be digitalized, to some extent. And this is to, actually a huge topic, but I'm going to focus on, on artificial intelligence because it's kind of a, of a hot topic right now. So uh, my name is Daniel uh, Akinine. I work as uh, something called the National uh, uh, Technology Officer. So I'm responsible for policy and, and strategy uh, in Sweden for Microsoft. I also work a lot uh, on security. Uh, security and IT is probably the most hot topic right now for, for a lot of reasons. Transport styles, and for instance. This has kind of boosted the, uh, the interest in, in uh, security. Uh, I also work in, in some other areas, uh, especially in, in law, uh, and where digitalization and law meets. Uh, what can you and should you be able to do uh, in Swedish law compared to, for instance, artificial intelligence? Should you have artificial intelligence being able to make decisions for you uh, from a government perspective, for instance? So there's a lot of interesting uh, questions there. So, but let's start. So I had um, uh, the opportunity, I think this was two years ago, um, to spend some time uh, uh, with the material that was going into uh, uh, World Economic Forum. And uh, I, I just wanted to show you something there, uh, which I think was interesting. It was kind of a, a fun uh, exercise, but what they did was uh, they went out and they asked uh, a lot of uh, different organizations, companies, and researchers what do you think will be the probability that you will have a tipping point on this scenario for the next, oh, to up to 2025? So the tipping point is, it could be a lot of things, but the price and demand, etc., means it's accelerating uh, at that point. So I just want to give you some, some examples of what they uh, found out. So for instance, number 13 on that list is, uh, uh, the first artificial intelligence would be on the board of directors in the company and actually doing stuff. Uh, which could be, uh, it doesn't sound so strange actually. So for a human being, being in the board of director, normally uh, you are making decisions based on facts. And people are pretty bad on doing decisions based on facts. Because you can have three, five, six, eight facts maybe. A machine can do it for hundreds, thousands of fact points. So it, it would be a great value, actually, to have a, an artificial intelligence to have a dialogue on to make good decisions, fact-based decisions on in companies. Number 12, so 10% of the global uh, GD, uh, GDP will be stored in some kind of uh, blockchain technology. Uh, blockchain is also a technology that is under discussion right now. A uh, lot of innovations going on, kind of immature, I would say, uh, at the moment. But there's a lot of innovations and potentially it could uh, actually re revolutionize a lot of industries. Um, number 11, uh, with 63% chance of happening, is the first city with more than 50,000 uh, persons. Uh, we'll have no traffic lights. So you're creating an, a society or a city that is so intelligent, with so intelligent cars, etc., and systems, that you don't need any traffic lights. Number 10, uh, globally more trips, journeys with uh, car sharing than in private cars. That trend is going on. Uh, number 9, 30% of all corporate audits will be perfor performed by an artificial intelligence. There's so also a lot of focus on trying to automate audits, uh, economy, uh, and that stuff that is rules-based. If it's rules-based, it's also pretty simple, to some extent, to, uh, to go in, in, in the area of artificial intelligence. And number eight, the first um, uh, transplant of a 3D printed liver. Uh, so we have the uh, Macarini scandal in Sweden, of course, which was trying to do something like that, but it's still, of course, a, a trend, which is going to happen, uh, finally, uh, in the end. Uh, number seven, driverless cars will be 10% of all cars on US roads. Number six, the first implantable mobile phone will be in your brain or in your body somehow, so you can communicate uh, with uh, not watching on a screen. Number five, uh, the first 3D printed car will be in production. Number Four is 10% of all reading glasses will be connected to the internet somehow and maybe give you more 
uh, more power of understanding what you read and get some multimedia maybe uh, on that. Uh, the first robotic pharmacist will be in the US, number three. And number two is that there will be one trillion um, sensors that will be connected to the internet. So what's number one? It's impossible to guess, of course. But number one is that 10% uh, of all people will have clothes connected to the in internet. So your underwear in the future will be able to warn when it's uh, going to want to be changed. So the point is, is really to show you this, is that technology is, is, is not silent. Uh, technology is affecting uh, a lot of different industries. So if you are in an industry that will be influenced by some of those trends, maybe not every one of those will happen. I think uh, uh, you know, the majority of those will happen. Uh, and you will see them happen. Uh, and if you are in that industry, it could be a very positive experience and it could be a very negative experience because it could you know, influence you badly or influence you in a positive way. So, so the, the time frame, just clarify, is 2025? 2025, yeah. And that's not far. It's not far. Um, so I'm going to spend some time on, on artificial intelligence then. So um, sometimes people are saying, well, artificial intelligence is in the future. So it's, it's beyond me, even. Uh, that's not true. Uh, so actually, you're seeing artificial intelligence happening uh, right here, uh, right now, but in very specialized areas. Uh, so I will give you one example. So uh, in the US and in London, uh, you have something called the Do Not Pay Bot. So if you get the parking ticket in London or in New York, um, you can start talking to this bot. So if you get a parking ticket normally, what do you do? Well, you normally get very angry and upset. Uh, and you're thinking, oh, well, I, I didn't park wrong, blah, blah, blah. But you don't try to go to court about that parking ticket because it's too time consuming and it's five or 600 crowns. So normally you just, you know, if you don't get very angry, you probably just uh, leave it and pay it. But if you're in London or New York, you could go to this bot instead. So you could start uh, talking to this bot and you would say, well, I was parking here and it would say, well, too bad. So what happened? What was the weather conditions? How, what was the time? Uh, and blah, 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 blah. And it has a lot of information about different parking tickets, parking regulations in New York and in London. And it can compare, it can compare earlier decisions, it can compare the rules. So maybe it says, well, you have to pay, or it says, well, I could try to send in, and um, uh, try to overrule this, uh, or object on this, um, uh, this parking ticket. Uh, and I get 10% if I win, maybe it says. And that's kind of a good deal. You will probably accept that. Uh, so it has actually challenged approximately 250,000 parking tickets in, in, uh, in London and New York. And it has won 160,000 cases. So it's a lot. How many here have won a parking ticket? Uh, I, have, I have never. Ah, almost. Almost. That doesn't count. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, so... Uh, it's here already. It is affecting, of course, if you are in the parking de uh, department there, you're getting a lot. So maybe you have to automate yourself to be able to handle that massive amount of, uh, of, uh, of uh, parking overruptions. So uh, anyway, um, and then the, the question is, of course, if it happens, and it happens here and now, and if it happens in specialized areas, could it affect much more than those specialized areas? And that has been the discussion that has started to you know, become bigger and bigger for the last one, two years, I would say. And that is, of course, how could automation impact Sweden? How could automation impact the, the jobs and what kind of jobs? And there has been some research going on uh, on that. Um, uh, I think the most, uh, uh, the most recognized or the most uh, uh, public, at least, is the SSF, Stiftelsen for Strategisk Forskning, that did a calculation 
think it was two years ago, and they said half. Uh, well, half of all of the jobs uh, in Sweden will be go gone uh, in 20 years. So in 2037, half of us are free to explore our own possibilities, which means you will be fired, more or less. So um, the question is, I think, people in general think this is very bad. They think it's very dangerous. And what will that mean to society? But I think it's also interesting to ask yourself, is this good or bad? Because it doesn't necessarily have to be bad. So people are working too much. Uh, people get stressed. People get sick uh, by working too much. So maybe you could actually work less and get the same productivity level because it will have the same productivity, but with less work. Um, but it could also not necessarily be good. So um, do you really need to work? Uh, I, I took a look at, at this guy. He's called uh, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, and he's the inventor of the, the term flow. So that when you get very you know, super engaged in something and the world just stop, stop working and you get very, very effective. And he had been looking at a lot of different uh, other areas as well. So he did something which I, you could call it the work paradox, which is kind of interesting. It says, that, well, he followed a lot of people. So he had a lot of people follow it. And basically, he, uh, he said, you know, during the day when they were working, they had to do an estimate of how they felt. Do you feel good? Do you are feeling upset? Do you feel stressed? Do you feel uh, you know, comfort? trying to understand what people actually valued and how they felt during the day. And um, the result there was that people actually were happier when they were at work. So when they were working, compared to when they were free, they were happier when they were working. Um, so when they were free, they actually felt more worried. They had a lack of discipline. They went into Facebook. They got stressed with social media. They were also more bored and actually more irritated as well uh, on their free time. Um, but nobody wanted to go back to work. So I think the point is that uh, we are not very intelligent, I think, in understanding what actually makes us happy. But I think there is a point that if you are not working at all, that doesn't necessarily mean you will have a, a better quality of life or be happier just by not working. So I don't think it's necessarily uh, the solution to be, to be much happier. I think society, some kind of, you know, the rules in the society means you have to have some meaning at least. So you have to have another meaning then, uh, than working. Uh, so I think that um, the question then is how, how much actually will uh, be stolen more or less by artificial <coughs> intelligence? And what can artificial intelligence do today? Well, basically, there is two types of knowledge uh, that artificial intelligence could address. The one of those knowledges is uh, something called explicit knowledge. So it's knowledge that you can write down. So you can write it down in a book, or you can look at YouTube film, and you can transfer that knowledge, more or less. So it's like, how do you fix a flat tire on a bike. If you want to understand that knowledge, you can read a book about it. You can look at the YouTube uh, video or something else. So it's knowledge that can be written down. If it can be written down, you can probably create a bot or an algorithm or a robot that can fix that as well, because it's a manual that could be programmatically solved. Uh, but there's other types of knowledge, of course, as well. So implicit knowledge, Something is called tacit knowledge uh, in English, tyst uh, uh, in Sweden. So it's another type of knowledge. It's a knowledge like driving a car, for instance, uh, which is not very simple to read a book about. It's knowledge like playing tennis. You can't read a book about playing tennis even if it's a very big book, and then go out and, and go out to Wimbledon and suddenly win Wimbledon uh, by never playing tennis. You cannot learn uh, a lot of stuff, and you can't explain it. So you can all here uh, are very good at understanding the differences between two pictures, for instance. 
but if I ask you how you can actually understand or explain why you actually recognize those pictures, you w will say, I don't know, because you don't know. You just do it. And that kind of knowledge is much more difficult to optimize, actually. So it's like recognizing a picture, it's driving a car, it's knowledge that you cannot explain. The, qu the, the point is, though, um, that we're seeing another type of evolution in artificial intelligence right now. So this uh, is something called Microsoft's uh, caption bot. Um, so uh, basically it says like this, I can understand any picture that you upload and I will try to explain what's in the picture. So if you upload uh, a picture of uh, a cow standing on a, uh, on a field, it will say, I think it's a herd of cattle which is standing on a field. And it sounds very simple, uh, of course, but this is decades of uh, research in, in, in image recognition, of course, that's uh, taking place here. But I think the interesting thing here, which we are talking about explicit and implicit knowledge, is that uh, I actually told you that things like recognizing a picture and what's inside that picture is a version of implicit knowledge. And the thing is, do Microsoft's caption bot have implicit knowledge now? Do we see the next generation artificial intelligence actually going into that area of implicit knowledge? Uh, and I would say no, uh, I don't think so. What we are seeing happening is the next generation, uh, generation of artificial intelligence going in and being very effective on simulating that they have artificial uh, implicit knowledge. So they don't necessarily truly understand what's on that picture, but they are very good at simulating that they actually do. Uh, but it's a difference. And I will come to what that difference actually is. Sometimes they are better in recognizing pictures, for instance. They are better, actually, of recognizing voice than people are. That happened last year. Uh, they will be better on driving cars in the end. I think that we, as people, will not be uh, allowed to drive cars uh, in the end because we are too dangerous uh, compared to artificial intelligence. But they are still, and I will come to back to that, they are still <coughs> algorithms. They are still very focused on a box of, of um, when you go outside that box, they are very bad. And, and I will give you some examples. So the question is then, how can this type of uh, artificial intelligence affect different types of, of work? Well, uh, one of the uh, ways you can have uh, understanding of that is if we look up. And what I mean with that is if we look at the airline industry. Because the airline industry is an industry where artificial intelligence and automation has been taking place for the last 40 or 50 years. So it's a, it's a, it has been already applied in the aviation industry. And it's quite uh, interesting. So if you look at the original crew on an airplane when in the 50s or so, you basically had five people in that crew. So you had a pilot, you had a co-pilot, you had a na navigator, you had a radio man, and you had an engineer that would take, you know, fix stuff that uh, went wrong in the airplane. So in the 50s, the radio man disappeared. So he was automated or technology took over his role, more or less. So the pilots could do the, the you know, the radio stuff uh, instead. It became simpler. In the 60s, the navigator disappeared, so you didn't have GPS, but you had a lot of other technologies, and suddenly the pilots could take over that as well. So automation basically stalled the, the work of the, the uh, navigator in the airplanes. In the uh, 70s, uh, the engineer disappeared. So maybe they thought that if something happens at 10,000 meters, it's too late anyway. So uh, he doesn't have really a place in the, in the cockpit. So he disappeared. And in the 80s, 1981 actually, there was the current regulations about uh, what kind of crew do you need to have uh, to fly an airplane. 
And basically it's two persons. It's a pilot and it's a co-pilot. But in the aviation industry, they are currently discussing, is that too many, really? So maybe you should actually fly those airplanes uh, by themselves. Uh, do we really need two persons? Or do you really need humans uh, at all in those planes? And it's, uh, I think it's a very uh, um, effective question that makes a lot of people think. So, and, and I think that we don't really understand the answer to that question as well. So um, I will give you two options. <clears throat> and I will soon ask you what you think. So please reflect a little bit on, on those questions. So it, basically, you have two options. The, the, one of the options is to have, do you, do you prefer to have an airplane where you sit down and fly over to the US or something like that? To have an airplane that makes, well, it basically has the artificial intelligence of the autopilot being the, the person or the technology that can override the pilot or the human if it's a complex situation. So the autopilot could say, uh, I'm taking over the plane. Or would you prefer to have a pilot basically being the person that has the possibility and the force to override the, the autopilot? So basically you have two options. One, is it an airplane where the autopilot can take command if it thinks the pilot is doing something wrong? How many of you would like to fly in that kind of an airplane? Yeah, it's approximately half. That's normally the case. So I guess then the other uh, thing that uh, you would prefer to fly in an airplane where the pilot uh, is the man that takes command. And I, I don't think there is a right and wrong answer to that. Uh, but actually, you could think a little bit about what kind of airplane you are uh, taking. Because there is a design philosophy that is different between the big uh, airline uh, producers. So Airbus has for, for many, many years been focusing just on automation. Trying to make fly-by-wire planes where you're basically given instruction saying, you know, go 10 meters up and it will go 10 meters up. Uh, Boeing has been automating as well, but they have been trying to give a lot of more power to the, uh, the pilots as well trying to give them more training, tactile feedbacks in, in, in the tooling, etc. So there's a difference there. And the question is, which is best? Um, and which will continue to be best? Uh, both planes are very safe. It's very safe to fly, of course. It's, it's, it's not that they are necessarily uh, unsafe, but there is happening things in the airline industry that makes you question if automation, artificial intelligence, is the right way. And I will give you some examples. So in 2009, uh, there was a flight called Flight 3407 that was flying from, uh, from New York, in New York, uh, over to, uh, um, to Buffalo. And that plane, uh, it crashed. So it's probably a one hour flight less, probably. It crashed when it was going down in, uh, in Buffalo. And the uh, pilots uh, were two. You had a pilot and a co-pilot. So Marwin, he was the pilot, and Rebecca uh, Shaw was the co-pilot. So uh, both of them had quite a lot of uh, flying experience, uh, many hours. Uh, even Rebecca, which, had, uh, which was obviously much younger. Um, but the question is what happened. So if you look at what actually happened, when they were flying into Buffalo, uh, it was this scenario. So approaching Buffalo, suddenly the pilot, Marvin, he felt that the controls were shaking. So they started to shake. shake. And um, why? This is, was a warning. So the controls to start to shake, give some tactic feedback, because the plane was lift, uh, starting to lose its uh, lifting force, more or less. So it was going too slow. And it had very, very, uh, um, not so strong lifting force. So what happens then is that the autopilot disconnects because it feels there is something wrong. It doesn't have the capability of fixing a crisis situation. Uh, so it, it releases more or less. And it says, hey, you have to take over this now. So what happened then? Well, Marvin, 
the thing is that if you lose uh, the lift force, that means the plane is going too slow, actually. Because the faster it goes, the stronger the lifting force is. So it was going too slow. And what do you have to do? Well, you have to drop your nose to gain more speed, uh, which will mean you have more lifting uh, power, of course. So what Marvin did was actually the exact opposite. So he reacted as a pilot on the exact opposite what he was kind of trained to do as a pilot. So he lifted, he pulled the controller in the other way, uh, which me meant basically the plan, uh, plane was uh, losing uh, lifting power. What happens then is that uh, uh, the planes have something called an, um, a stall avoidance system that basically goes in and say, well, we are in a very serious situation. Uh, if you are going into a stall situation, the plane is just going to drop. Uh, and it tried to take over the plane, so it tried to pull the, 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 the uh, controls in the other way. And Marvin, he took with his power, more or less, and fight, fought against that. So he fought against the autopilot. And what happened was that, uh, of course, it, it crashed. So a couple of seconds later, the plane just crashed. And the question then is, is this a, a, you know, a unique situation uh, from, from the, the situation where Marvin, for instance, was very untrained? Um, but if you look at some other incidents, it's not necessarily so. So if you look at another incident in 2009, an Airbus uh, 330 is going from uh, Rio de Janeiro to Paris. He flies out a couple of uh, hours into the Atlantic. And it goes into um, uh, a storm. And the autopilot, it loses control because the sensors get jammed. So the autopilot doesn't get correct sensor data. And then it says, hey, I cannot fly this plane anymore. Uh, US pilots need to take over. And what happened was kind of the similar situation that happened in the, uh, uh, at the former case, where Marwin lost control. So, if you look at the incident report for this case, uh, it says, well, there was a total loss of cognitive control uh, of the situation uh, in this case. Um, and you know the, do you know the average time, actually, a, a pilot flies today? If you are going over to the US, how, how long do you think a pilot actually flies the plane? Half an hour. To half an hour? Take off and landing. Take off and landing. Seven minutes. Seven minutes. It's good. Good guesses. <laughs> it is uh, three minutes. <laughs> yeah, and you were right. So it's uh, one to two minutes when it starts. It's one to two minutes when it lands. So an average, in average, a pilot doesn't have, it doesn't get cogni cognitive training from the plane anymore. It, it normally just sits and observes uh, what the plane does. So the, the report basically shows that three out of four pilots think that they are flying worse and worse. And even though they are getting training in simulators, they don't get that kind of long-term training that you would get if you were flying the plane hours and hours every day, more or less, and get basically muscle memory in your, in your hands. Um, so Rory King, he basically su summarized the, the trends were no, basically forgetting how to fly uh, as pilots. And automation is actually one of the reasons why this is happening. <laughs> then you could ask yourself, if the pilots then are the problem and seem to become less and less uh, qualified of flying the planes, maybe we actually don't need the pilots. Um, so I was in uh, New York last summer, uh, and I took with my family a um, uh, sightseeing out of uh, the Hudson and going over uh, Manhattan. And then the, the tour guide he said to me, well, right, actually, right now we are over the exact place where uh, the Hudson miracle happened, if you remember that uh, incident. It was also happening in 2009. And that was a kind of an interesting <coughs> um, incident. And I, I will show you uh, what happened here. And this is actually the authentic voice from, from that incident. And then we can discuss it. Okay. 
Objected. 15.9 square feet of contact time, maintain one to 5,000. Maintain one to 5,000, contact is 1549. Cactus 15.9, turn left heading 270. Uh, this is uh, Cactus 15.39, it's Bird 2, follow through on the phone, it's returning back towards the morning. Okay, uh, you need to return all right, turn left heading up uh, 220. 220. Sorry, stop you to Parker, it's got an emergency returning. Hello, this is 15.9, he, uh, Bird Strike, he lost all engine, he lost the thrust in the engine, he's returning immediately. Cactus 15.29, which engines? He lost thrust in both engines, he said. Got it. Cactus 1529, we can get it to you. Do you want to try to lay in 191 brake? 491, we made it in the office. All right, Cactus 1529, could be left traffic to runway 31. Unable. Okay, what do you need to land? Do you want to try to go to Teterboro? Yes. Teterboro, uh, Empire, actually, LaGuardia Park, Sky, Mercy, and Mount. There you go. Cactus 1529, over to George Washington Bridge, wants to go to the airport right now. Let's go to the airport, Jack. Does he need assistance? Uh, yes, yeah, it was a bird strike. Can I get him in for uh, runway one? Runway one, that's good. Can I get 1529? Turn right 280, you can land runway right. one in Cedar Rock. We can't do it. Okay, which runway would you like at Cedar Rock? We're going to be the other one. I'm sorry, say again, Cactus. Cactus 1529, radar contact is lost. You also got Newark Airport up at 2 o'clock in about 7 miles. Eagle 5.718, Charlotte, thing 210. 212, 2718. I think this this case is so much different than the the other cases. So, who do you th actually do you think an artificial intelligence could land that plane? Uh, you know, no, because this is so many other things that you have to understand. So you you haven't autopilots that are programmed to land on water because normally you don't know how to land on water you have too, too little data on that. There's a lot of other decisions that has to be made so you're flying over Manhattan which is the most dense populated area uh, in the world so you have a lot of ethical uh, decisions to make so maybe I should actually sacrifice this plane instead of trying to make a risk in flying over Manhattan and, and, and lose so there's a lot of other things that an autopilot would be totally incompetent in doing in that area. So if we were just flying with planes and autopilot, it would be a totally different situation in this case. So I think we are still really in need of a kind of a combination of humans and, and, and AI. So I think we still need experienced, and with the point actually of being experienced, people in complicated situations. And the question is then, why uh, are we better than humans? I think what actually makes us different, um, it, it's not our understanding of you know, data or, or patterns and stuff like that. Uh, we can do that, but artificial intelligence will be better on that. They are already better. But it's our ability basically to create knowledge of stuff that we see, we hear, we understand, we are you know, talking to people, we are understanding context in a way that artificial intelligence is not doing. So we understand water, for instance, what water does, and we understand that we could possibly land on water. We are understanding so much more of the world that makes us so much better on, on making decisions. And we are making those decisions on problems that happen. And if that happens then, I think if both man and machine will be needed, then the question is not, you know, should we replace each other, is how can we work better together. And I'm a little bit worried what's happening in that area right now, because uh, if you go into what's happening from the technology side, uh, there is a very strong focus on basically replacing uh, people more or less. So they say the solution, if it's a bad automation, if something happens which is complicated, well, then that's the fault of the automation. So let's make better automation or more automation. That's kind of the current trend. And make people observers. So make people just observers to the situation. Uh, I think that's the worst thing that could happen, really. People are very, <coughs> very bad at observing. Uh, and I will tell you why. 
I got this slide from um, a researcher at uh, SIX, uh, or RISE, uh, that works with ABB, for instance. And they, they are looking on how does the future uh, worker look like in the, in the automation or process industry. So if you take this scenario, uh, you have Tim, or uh, Nick, sorry, uh, scenario. He's born in 1995. He has played video games since he was five years old. He has an APM at 220 in the computer game StarCraft. APM means actions per minute, so he can you know, do 220 actions per minute. His best friends has the highest uh, level in World of Warcraft, with all that that means on you know, doing strategy and leading armies of people. Uh, multitasking is part of everyday experience. He gets positive feedback 100 times, more or less, per hour. When he sits there and does the uh, observation of the automation uh, process, <laughs> it's an APM of four events per hour at the, at the uh, traditional uh, process industry. Uh, and the thing is, what will happen? Well, Nick will be a very, he wants to do good work, of course. Everybody wants to do good work and get a career and, and you know, develop. But he will be very, very bad because it's so boring uh, that he will not learn from that process and he will not be an effective person. So observing is, is not a good thing. So maybe we could just create algorithms that observe the, the algorithms then. And I think, yes, actually that could be part of the uh, solutions. But there is also uh, a lot of algorithms and decisions that people have to be part of. Uh, and I will give you one, another example of that. So uh, maybe in uh, 10 years, uh, well, seven to ten years you will buy your first uh, self-driving car and that self-driving car will drive you home and suddenly there comes out uh, uh, a kid maybe just six seven meters in front of the car and even if it's not a fast car you're driving very fast it's still you know there's still impact and you there's a hundred percent more or less chance of impact so what you normally would do if you're driving that car, you would do exactly what I would do. Uh, you would just brake. And you do, will do that instinctively. Um, and it would be an accident probably. And you will probably get blamed to some extent, but it was kind of an accident. Uh, you didn't see that. But for a machine, uh, for this car, it's different. Even if this happens in a fraction of a second, the car has the possibility to think. It can think a lot of things during those milliseconds. And it will come to the conclusion, I can do three things. I don't necessarily have to just brake. I could brake. I could do a scenario A here. Uh, that would mean that you as a driver would be probably not hurt. 2% chance that you will get some injury as a driver. Uh, the pedestrian in this case will be hurt by 70% because it knows it's going to hit it by 4 kilometers per hour and in 4 kilometers per hour 70% of everybody who gets hit get injured. The vehicle will probably not get any injuries but it could if the airbag maybe releases or something like that. Or it could do a scenario A which means it could drive into the uh, the side instead, in the wall inside. And uh, that means you will probably get hurt somehow. The uh, airbag will get, you know, explode and you will in 45% chance get uh, uh, injured. The pedestrian will have a much better chance, still not zero, but much better. Uh, and the vehicle will be 100% chance that that will be uh, uh, injured. Or it's uh, the third option, which has, you know, totally different uh, possibilities. And then the question is, what will we program our cars to do, really? So if you are in that car, and you're in that car with your family, all of your family, uh, don't you want that car actually to protect you in all of those scenarios? Of course you want. If you're going out here in the city and have 20 cars surrounded you, <laughs> and all of those cars is only protecting the, uh, the <laughs> persons driving it, you don't want to go around in that city. So 
actually, what will the cars do? It could also be if it's, if it's just left to commercial interests, maybe even the insurance company would be involved. So it says, well, you should always do number one here because uh, and then you could get better um, insurance policy because I would protect the car in all the, of the incidents or something like that. So there's a lot of complications here and I think we need to have a discussion on who is responsible for these algorithms and the scenarios when, when uh, we are programming our environment with artificial intelligence. Because uh, it's, it's not really about only leaving that up to the suppliers, I think. This is a societal question. So I will wrap up. Yeah. Just about yep. the options for the autonomous driven car here. Um, Okay, two reflections only. First of all, the first one is that the ethical choice involved in making priorities here in some way must then be entered into the algorithm taking the decision. And of course that leads to a very complex question of renegotiating the distribution of responsibility and uh, if you just could reflect on that question a little bit, mm. I would appreciate that yeah. very much. Yeah, it is a very complex question. And, and as you say, who is responsible for things that artificial intelligence do? So I think we are in an environment that we are accepting things that happens, which is bad because of uh, human uh, errors, more or less. We are accepting human errors. So if you're going to do an operation, for instance, well, you're accepting that the doctor will fail 5% of the times. At least he will succeed in 95% of the time. If he fails those 5% and it's you, well, it's too bad, but that's the fact of life. So if you take a robot, for instance, that will be successful in 98% of those cases, uh, you will not really accept those 2% when the robot fails. Because then, you know, something goes wrong and the robot kills you and you are blaming the technology and stuff like that. So I think we, are, we have to rethink on, the, on how safe technology should be. I think there is a notion that technology needs to be 100% safe all the time. I think that's the current status. I think in the future we will have to accept that technology could also hurt us. But it should at least be better than when we are humans uh, in those scenarios. So I think the responsibility is uh, the responsibility question is complex. Uh, exactly, if this is the car manufacturer that will be responsible for people that get injured by the system, or if it's not, it's not really clear. Uh, I think it, it should be if it is very bad. <laughs> technology, if it is good and uh, better than humans, then you could accept that as a society. But it's a complex question and it's really in the early days of discussing uh, that kind of scenario. But it will happen and it will happen very soon. Um, yeah, I'm wrapping up. So. Um, how do we then work best together? This is not a you know, super complex uh, curve, really. It's saying that if you, are, if you as a human are doing very, very little, you are very, very bad at performing, uh, performance, basically at performing your work. Like Nick, the automation guy. If he has, has no input at all, he's not trained, he is basically very bored, and he has a very low performance. If you are like the pilots that suddenly get super lot of inputs, uh, you are also bad at performance because you're getting too much input, you can't control, and you perform very bad. So there is some, some middle way, of course, of human input that humans basically are good at. Uh, when we learn and we're also uh, capable of processing and uh, you know, uh, reacting to that information. Uh, I think the pilots versus Nick is a good example of the extremes. So basically I think the future is uh, AI that doesn't necessarily take over our works and makes us just observers. I think it's AI that helps us to be in the middle of that curve. 
uh, AI that you know, gives us input, helps us if it's too much for us to do, but also that is intelligent enough to give you tasks, like Nick, for instance. So it gives you tasks, get you trained, so you actually get more competent when you need it as a human. Uh, that's a colleague, more or less. So it's, it's, I think it's artificial intelligence working as a human college, more or less, trying to help you when you need help. Um, and I think that actually you, have, you could have a bright future on technology. So if I just repeat, what makes us smart and human is our ability <coughs> to understand the world, more or less. Because that makes us understand each other, it makes us understand and get us consciousness, etc. And I think if you, if you get new technology that helps us with that, so new technology that makes us see better, understand the world better, new technology that develops our senses better, it won't make us more like a robot. It will actually make us more human to some extent because we will understand the world even better than we are doing right now. So I think there is a possibility for kind of a bright future uh, when technology continues to develop. And one interesting thing is, I think, if you look at the um, research that uh, Mihaly, uh, Shikhsen Mihaly did when I was reading through that paper, so what activity do we actually like to do on our spare time when we are free and we don't have any pressure? What kind of activity actually makes us feel quite content uh, and empowered? Well, it's actually driving a car. So maybe the future for self-driving cars isn't that strong anyway. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I'm a little bit, it's a couple of minutes over. Thank you so yeah. much. Both when you're having a good time, right? Uh, I'm sure some of you have uh, other tasks that you would have to run to and so forth. But if you don't, uh, we can take a few minutes with questions still, right? Yeah, sure. Let's do that. So those of you that have to walk, of course, please do so. But we, we go on the rest of us for, for a few minutes. So who would like to start with some questions? Comment. Yes. Just a brief question. I, I'd like to hear your comment on it today. I, when you, when you uh, talked about um, this uh, accident and the AI counting on different scenarios. But isn't it so, if you take a historical perspective, that in, in one sense that technology has always been programmed in, in its design to make some uh, choices? I mean, when you have a bumper on the car, uh, it will have a different impact on the, the person you drive through. So in one sense, I'm just thinking that maybe some of these issues are not totally new by the fact that this is a new new type of technology, but our relations to technology and how we design things hmm. have always had an impact on... Yes, I agree on that. Uh, but I would also like to add that the, the new type of technology, the artificial intelligence that works with data primarily, uh, those types of, um, of, of artificial intelligence it's very difficult to explain why they are taking those decisions uh, right now. So we are developing technology where the technology cannot necessarily explain why it takes a decision, actually. Uh, and the, the, that example is, for instance, the, uh, the AI was explaining that, you know, can understand um, uh, pictures, etc. So we're going into a situation where probably this car in the future uh, you will ask it and say, what happened? Why did you take that decision? And you will have the answer, I don't know. Uh, you don't know. And, and that's kind of the future we're going to. And that means also it's, it's, it's a different type of technology that we have to have another way of looking at. And what I'm looking at right now is, if we're looking at, for instance, artificial intelligence making decisions from the government, for instance, they could be very, very powerful. It could, you know, an immigration uh, decision, for instance. Maybe it takes a lot of facts and it comes to the conclusion, well, you are allowed to stay or you have to leave the country. Um, and they are, could be proven to be very effective. Uh, but the thing is, really, uh, those algorithms can't necessarily explain why they took that decision. And is that a, uh, a future that you want to have? So you're getting decisions hitting you 
but you can't get an explanation. So the government is basically saying, well, the algorithm told us so, and mm -hmm. statistics shows the algorithm is very good at this. And that's a complicated scenario, I think. Yeah. I, I just uh, think the legal aspect is very important. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned this, one of your future scenarios, that there will be a AI board members. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's, I would say it's just a support function. Yeah. It's a very important mm -hmm. part of being yeah. a board member yeah. is legal responsibility yes. for this firm. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then another comment, I think the problem with autonomous cars in densely populated cities mm. will be that pedestrians learn they can just walk in front of them, they will stop, so these cars won't get anywhere. It's a good point, and uh, we are seeing that happening as well. People is, is uh, fooling uh, the, the technology, and it's actually it's pretty simple to do that. They have been shown that technology can, uh, can recognize a picture and be very powerful on that, but if you just change one pixel, if you understand exactly how technology works, and you change one pixel, the meaning totally gets different. So it's very easy to trick technology uh, right now. You could trick it with autonomous cars, maybe sending a laser beam and then it will you know, crash. Yeah, I was uh, just reflecting on what you said. Uh, if uh, there's a 2% chance uh, with operations that they might fail mm. and you might die, mm. uh, and a doctor could give you an explanation on what happened, and you can't get, get that from uh, a robot, mm. uh, how do we continue to learn? How we will yeah. continue to learn from That's situations? That's a very good question. Yeah. I think this is a, a very, very interesting question, especially in the medical area. Yeah. So uh, what we are seeing is that, as, as the pilots, for instance, if you are doing your stuff ordinary day out of day, you get so much competence, which is gut feel, uh, basically, which is competence, actually, even if it's gut feel. So um, a doctor in the future, if the artificial, if you are having a um, going into a doctor's room and you are having an artificial intelligence robot and a, a human doctor there, if you are getting the scenario where you are starting to talk with the artificial intelligence and doing the diagnostics and all of that stuff and the doctor is just observing, I think the future doctors will be uh, less and less competent. Yeah. Uh, and if you are doing that as the future, I think we are having some problems actually. I think we have to reverse that. Um, basically have a doctor that is using the AI as an expert, uh, but still focusing on the human. Uh, but you are going to get into a situation where the AI will be much more powerful in doing the diagnostics. And we are already there in some cancer uh, diagnostics, yeah. actually. Okay, thank you once more, both of you. Yeah. I think we've all got some more interesting food for thought yeah. and then have to uh, take this, these issues first. Thanks a lot.